Who are you? When you meet somebody new, what do you, who do you say that you are? You probably start with your name, but that doesn't really tell the other person much about you except what you prefer to be called. So maybe you tell them what you do for a living, or what you did before you were retired. Maybe you tell them where you're from, or who your parents were, or what you like to do with your free time. But the truth is, none of that is you. Those are things about you, but they aren't you. In order to know who you are, a person has to spend some time with you. All those things are parts of what make up our identity, along with other things like our gender and our ethnicity and our political views and all those other little things that we use to make sense of ourselves. Each of those little factoids helps us categorize people. Man or woman, black or white, pilot or insurance salesperson or plumber. We take what we know about other people like that and we apply it to the people who wear that, these labels. Now usually this works and sometimes it helps us to know something about someone else, someone else very quickly, but sometimes it doesn't. For example, when I meet people for the first time, especially people who I know I won't see again or get to know very well, I usually avoid telling them that I'm a pastor. Pastor is one of those identities that comes with a lot of assumptions about who a person is. And sometimes I really don't want those strangers to apply those assumptions to me because they don't fit who I am. I want them to get a sense of who I am before they apply that pastor label to me. Another example, Stephanie's youngest sibling recently came out as gender non-binary and uses they, them pronouns. Now their biological sex is female, but much like how I feel about people's assumptions about the word, about the identity of pastor, they aren't comfortable with the assumptions that come with an identity of either male or female. They have both masculine and feminine traits within who they are. They fall somewhere between what we think of when we think of as either a man or a woman. Now that's just a couple of examples of how fluid and artificial identity can be. The reality is that the identities that we have, they're constructed. We make them. In fact, we spend a great deal of time making and curating our identities, carefully deciding what we will show people so that, we will, so that they will make the assumptions that we want them to about us. For most of us, it's an invisible and automatic process. Only on rare occasion, like when somebody like my sibling-in-law rejects a traditional identity and upends both our expectations and our grammar, does that process become obvious and intentional. When John appears on the scene, baptizing and preaching, and the Pharisees in Jerusalem want to know who he is, they ask him, which identity he claims. They want to know on whose authority he's acting and how they ought to treat him. And so they try to figure out, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Who are you? What do you say about yourself? They're asking which of these identities, which of these sets of assumptions and expectations they can use to make sense of him. But John rejects all of these identities. He rejects all the assumptions that the Pharisees try to make about him. Who he is cannot be explained by words like Messiah or Elijah or prophet. But that's not all John is rejecting here. With his message and his ministry, he is rejecting the Pharisees' very understanding of God. He is saying that the identities that they are using to describe God, just like the labels they're trying to use to describe him, are incomplete that they can't use that identity to understand who God is. And since that's the only way they know God, he's saying they really don't know who God is. So can you understand why the Pharisees are upset? Their entire identity, their whole way of understanding and knowing themselves is built on their understanding of God. To be Jewish means to be one of God's chosen people. 
By suggesting that they are wrong about who God is, John is also saying that they are wrong about who they are, that everything they know about themselves is false. So we spend so much time cobbling together these little bits of identity, gender and social class and race and career and what have, what have you, that when something calls these identities into question, we feel the need to defend them. It's kind of like a child on a beach trying to defend her sandcastle against the bigger kids who are running around kicking them all down. When John shows up, he's claiming to be sent from the same God who chose these Pharisees, but he's proclaiming a very different message. And so it's like he's trying to kick down their sandcastle. To the Pharisees, this is an act of aggression. It's an attack on them and their identity that they've spent so much time and energy curating. It's an attack on who they understand themselves to be. They see it as an attack on themselves. And that's why John gets arrested and executed. See, the Pharisees' problem, and our problem, is that we try to know God the same way we know ourselves and one another, through identities. But according to the evangelist, in Christ, God offers us an alternative to identity by which we might know God. And knowing God is important, the evangelist says, because knowing God helps us to know ourselves in a way that we never could otherwise. Jesus wants to make God known to us so that in his words we may have life and have it abundantly. The truth to which John testifies is that identities, even our religious identities, are not who we are. Beneath these identities, these small separate selves, these sandcastles we create, at the very center of our being exists our true self, our truest self, our real self, what we sometimes call a person's soul or spirit. Thomas Merton, the 20th century monk and contemplative, writes about this center. He says, At the center of our being is a point of nothingness, which is untouched by sin and illusion, a point of pure truth, a point or a spark which belongs entirely to God, which is never at our disposal, from which God disposes our lives, which is inaccessible to oh, the fantasies of our mind and the brutalities of our will. This little point of nothingness and of absolute poverty is the pure glory of God in us. It is, so to speak, God's name written in us as our poverty, as our indigence, as our dependence, as our birthright. It's like a pure diamond blazing with the invisible light of heaven. It's in everybody. And if we could see it, we would see these billion points of light coming together in the face and the blaze of a sun that would make all darkness and cruelty of life vanish completely. That point of light that Merton sees at the center of our being, that is the light which is the life of all people. It's what St. Paul is talking about when he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. At the center of our being, beneath our identities that we create, is a being created by God, animated by God, at one with God. And that's why when the priests and the Levites question John about who he is, he doesn't do what you or I would do. He doesn't explain who his parents are or how he came to be doing this or recite a creed. Instead, he points directly to God. He says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. To understand this is to understand who we really are apart from who we think we are. Our mistake is that we, we misunderstand, we, we mistake our constructed selves for our truest selves. We get 
so caught up in the sandcastles that we've made that we think that they are us. And we defend them, even to the death, never realizing that they're just walls and a ceiling and a floor around the pure glory of God alive within us. The light of creation shining and blazing out through us. We fail to recognize that we are united in God with everyone else. That these separate constructed identities are just an illusion that we've created. John points to this fundamental tragedy that because we don't even know who we are, we don't know the one who stands among us. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. As long as we remain ignorant to this truth, we will spend our entire existence fighting over the bits and the bobs that we stick together with spit and mud to create these separate selves, these identities, these illusions of who we are. And so, to show us who we are, Christ comes to show us God. The light of creation comes among us so that we might recognize in him the same light shining within us, within all humankind. And see that because it is Christ who lives in us, we are indeed all branches of the same vine, all castles constructed of the same sand. To see that Jesus meant it literally when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Not like yourself, but actually as an extension of yourself, as part of you. This kind of love is not only God's will for us, it's the very point and fulfillment of our being. Living in this reality allows us to know, to enjoy, to draw upon the light that is the life of all people. To experience that true life that Jesus describes as abundant and eternal. Knowing this God made flesh, this Christ who dwells within us, allows us to finally do what we never could on our own. To repent, to turn away from those incomplete uh, separate selves, those identities that we use to describe ourselves, that we construct, and to turn instead toward an existence in union with the light of all creation, a life of union with God and with one another. Such a turning away from these things that we think of as ourselves might feel like a dying to feel what you think is your very self slipping away. But during Advent, we remember that these things are not ourselves, that our true self, our real self exists deeper. When we remember what it is that we're turning toward, suddenly, even losing our very understanding of who we think we are, feels like losing nothing important at all.